Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to this live forum, uh, one of many uh, CSF presentations. And it's my pleasure to host this and I think you're going to be entertained and learn something over the next hour or so. And as we move on to the next slide, I want to introduce my colleagues and also the agenda. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, great uh, CSF uh, webinar. I'm Dr. Janet Pope, and this is um, brought to you by University of Glasgow, and the speakers will have maintained all uh, control over the content. So it's going to be an exciting hour. I'm the chair. I'm from Canada. With me is uh, no need for introduction, my colleagues. So Professor Phil Neese, and he is in uh, Washington School of Medicine in Seattle and um, is the penultimate in seronegative arthritis, particularly psoriatic arthritis. And he does trials in many other areas as well. And also uh, Professor Eric Ruderman, who is very well known for seronegative disease. He's at Northwestern, and um, I think you're going to have an interesting time. We're going to talk about seropositive, psoriatic, and um, axial disease today. So some housekeeping, um, you should stay on mute. You can answer Q&A if you don't know where it is yet, then you've been asleep for the last three years. However, to remind you, Q&A is usually at the bottom, and submit your questions at any time, and we will have Lots of time for discussion between the speakers. And so if there are also any issues, let us know. Um, so this is what we're going to be talking about. Um, the rationale for treatment selections in rheumatoid arthritis, rationale for the selections in psoriatic, and also in um, axial spondyloarthropathy. We'll have lots of time for discussion in between the talks and also at the end. So I think you'll be quite excited about this. Um, I'm just going to get ready here to share my screen and then we'll start and we'll have some dialogue as well. Um, so uh, bear with me for a second and we will get uh, going here. And um, so uh, as I say, we here's what we're going to do. And then looking, these are my disclosures. So rationale for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. I divided this up because there were a lot of things that went on recently at ULAR into pre-RA doing treat or not into RA into guidelines and safety and difficult to treat patients. So um, there were two exciting abstracts at ULAR. One was looking at methotrexate in arthralgia patients, patients with arthralgias at risk for rheumatoid arthritis. So if they had rheumatoid or close to rheumatoid, they wouldn't have been allowed in. And you can see, we know there probably is along the spectrum, a window of opportunity that the earlier we intervene, possibly the better patients will do. However, if you intervene too early, maybe they didn't have RA anyway. So maybe you could cure a disease that didn't exist. So this was a multi-site trial and they were randomizing about 120 patients to either methotrexate or placebo. And they were looking at MRI screening to see if there was subclinical synovitis. So some of you might say, well, actually, I think that's RA anyway, but they didn't have clinically obvious tender or swollen joints. And um, the graphs on the one side you can see here is that if you were on treatment, that's the red methotrexate versus placebo, you can see you're delaying the onset of getting inflammatory arthritis. Now, some of you might know, notice that these are ACPA positive patients where you're seeing the big difference in the top. And um, there was a huge risk reduction. If you remember, there, were there was a methotrexate trial many years ago presented and then published that was looking at whether or not you met uh, the ACR, ULAR, um, the criteria for rheumatoid arthritis. But a lot of those patients already had inflammatory arthritis but didn't meet criteria. And methotrexate while being used, just like in this study, while being used did seem to decrease the chance of getting overt synovitis. And of course, not everyone will get overt synovitis. And you can see there that um, as many as 60% might in the placebo group followed over the next 24 months. 
also a very interesting study, um, ARIA, it was presented initially at um, the um, ACR meeting and then more data at ULAR. So that was looking at abatacept, which may delay an RA, um, may delay RA in patients who had clinically suspect arthralgia or they actually had inflammatory arthritis, but only seen on MRI, so not seen clinically. And these were, I'll remind everyone that these were all ACPA positive patients. So it was 100 patients like this, and this had to be multi-sided. It's not easy to find all these patients. So they had arthralgia and a distribution that seemed like RA. They were all ACPA positive, and they couldn't have uh, swollen joints clinically, but they did have MRI inflammation in their dominant hand to be included. What happened here, this is really kind of neat. They had abatacept, 125 milligrams sub-Q once a week or placebo, and they had it for six months. What's neat though, is then they had no treatment for another full year of follow-up. So it was an 18 month study. So who were these people? 71% women, mean pain was four out of 10, three tender joints, zero swollen joints. And what they found was that 18 months off treatment after having abatacept, the number needed to treat to prevent one rheumatoid arthritis patient or clinically obvious synovitis patient was eight, which is a really acceptable and um, very good NNT in my opinion. You can look here in the first six months what happened while they were on treatment, the MRI improved, um, it, it doubled the amount on abatacept and on placebo progression of early uh, to, in, to obvious overt inflammatory arthritis, one in three on placebo and under one in 10 on abatacept and dropping out of the study because usually they had more pain and swelling. 43% of placebo dropout and only 14% uh, on abatacept. So two ways maybe of preventing RA, but again, if you if we start washing this down as ACPA positive only, we're going to have a number needed to treat that's really high because ACPA positive is not going to be a guarantee that everyone will get disease. What about the rationale for treatment in RA? Because that's what we're talking about today in my section. So Professor Smolin presented the RA recommendations or guidelines from ULAR, and they were pretty much the same with some caveats. So one thing in phase one, the ACR guidelines say, please avoid prednisone. So ULAR did a lit search, the uh, committee, and wanted to come up with whether or not the glucocorticoids plus methotrexate should still stand. So that's in phase one. And what they did find was that um, the number needed to treat to help people was low, but the number needed to harm wasn't low but it wasn't super high. It was kind of medium. So they said, use the glucocorticoids, but get them off as fast as possible. In phase two, when you have um, uh, poor predictors and you are uh, methotrexate, um, or triple therapy or methotrexate plus glucocorticoid and adequate responders, they said add a biodemard like the old guidelines and, and consider use of a jack only after risk assessment. So a jack was still allowed to be in that box, but to look at risk. And there was an asterisk giving the various risks of VTE, serious infections, and of course, MACE um, and zoster. And then also different was consider, may consider, doesn't mean you have to do it, dose reduction of either the CSD mart or the BioD mart, or if it's a targeted synthetic. Whereas it used to say, um, cons may consider, but don't have to if a patient's in a sustained low disease state or remission. It used to say, consider uh, tapering but not stopping the um, bio DMART or TS DMART. So th there's a, a study that informed them that either one could be uh, tapered down. And then really looking at um, still going on uh, if people don't meet the target, to try something else or optimize treatment. So really what was different? Rapid taper glucocorticoids, if you're going to use them, if you're gonna use the ACR guidelines, you're probably not gonna use oral glucocorticoids. After methotrexate, um, you can use any of the products approved, but consider uh, risk assessment in Jack and maybe maybe not consider it in high risk patients. And then tapering, um, if a patient's stable and at the shared decision, tapering bio DMART, TS DMART or the CS. Steam art.
And then the other thing that informed prednisone was um, uh, uh, Martin Bors uh, presented the Gloria study at um, the ACR and more data at uh, ULAR. So basically this study was COVID proof. Fortunately, it was going on throughout COVID, but they still were able to get uh, good data and a positive study. So what was this? Active RA in elderly patients, and they were randomized to um, have prednisolone or uh, about five milligrams of prednisone equivalent um, or placebo added to their standard of care. And the primary outcome, you can see here that study completion was 62% percent because of COVID, but it was a two-year study where you expect more dropout anyway. But you can see the change in DAS deeper is the blue, not the purple. And that's saying glucocorticoids added in did better. But there is a cost for doing this, and that's called harm. And the harm was a 1.24 adjusted relative risk of having a side effect, which was mostly non-serious infection. So I could say as devil's advocate, well, why not just have given them hydroxychloroquine with methotrexate? Would that be safer and arrive at the same um, result? And the answer is, I don't know, because no one's done that as a comparison. The other thing is in guidelines, we don't know what to use anyway. And that's why a lot of drugs or are, are, um, group classes of drugs are uh, leveled about the same, even though sometimes there's a trial of superiority, et cetera, because these are looking at a large group of patients, a um, good response and um, uh, on a ULAR response. And you can see a CDAR response, joint counts, et cetera. And it's difficult to tell which is which. Red is Jack, um, yellow is Abitacept versus Jack, et cetera, IL-6 we really don't know what to use within an individual, unfortunately. So what class to choose then after a TNF? I don't know. You can do another TNF, not my first choice because it's usually a blunted and a less durable response, but IL-6, Jack, Rituximab, Abitacept. And we know after TNF that um, at least one Jack, UPA, compared head to head with Abitacept, um, UPA was superior. Well, what about after a Jack? What should we do? Because there is Jack cycling, Jack pot, a whole bunch of databases combined had data, but this is, um, a countrywide data looking in Belgium and looking at after the first jack failure, non-randomized, what should you use next? And the answer is probably anything, but interestingly, after a jack in this study, the best response was IL-6, but all the other ones, B-cell, T-cell, they combined it because they were smaller numbers, or jack to jack or TNF had about the same responses. It's not randomized, food for thought. It wouldn't have been what I would have thought about that in a jack going to an IL-6. I wouldn't have thought that that was the most optimal. But anyway, interesting. What about the rationale for treatment in rheumatoid arthritis and difficult to treat patients? So difficult to treat was defined by ULAR a few years ago. And first of all, we're aiming for remission. So even our easiest to treat patients, so early RA where we can treat to a target in groups that have an interest in early RA, such as the Canadian catch cohort, um, half the patients can get to CDI remission and uh, SDI remission. So that's a very tight definition. So, and it's the best uh, cohort of getting to this tight definition yet that's um, been presented. So half cl class is half empty or half full, but over the next two years, half of that half go out of remission and you go out of remission more or don't maintain it if you have comorbidities. And these are our easiest to treat patients. So ULAR has a definition and the definition is a whole grab bag of patients because some might be non-adherent and intolerant. Some might be multiple drug failures and some might have other issues going on where they can't taper glucocorticoids. So in difficult to treat real world practice, this is a study um, looking uh, at a Japanese database. What they found was um, almost one in 10 were difficult to treat because they had um, not responded or at secondary loss of response to one or more bio or targeted synthetic DMARDs. But 40% of their difficult to treat were already well experienced into advanced therapies. So these patients do exist in all our practices and they're probably 10, 15% of your practice possibly. So why might a patient be difficult to treat? Well, they might not be adherent. They might not tolerate drugs. They might be rapid metabolizers. They might be misclassified. Maybe they have pseudogout. We hope they're not misclassified. They might have a score that's not related to disease activity. If you have a CDI of 21 with one swollen joint, MD global of one, 
you probably don't have active RA in my opinion, but your CDI is high being driven by patient global, eight out of 10 in tender joints. And maybe all these reasons could be occurring. So there was a study uh, presented at ULAR on difficult to treat patients. This is out of France. And I think what's actually telling us um, the challenge is, um, you know, they failed lots of drugs. Sure, they're complex patients. We get it. They have comorbidities. But low socioeconomic status was a big driver of the data. So our patients who are already vulnerable also tend to have more comorbidities, but they're also in general more difficult to treat. And the comorbidities are things like interstitial lung disease from their RA, also some COPD, but type 2 diabetes in particular. The other thing in difficult to treat, maybe we got to think outside of the box, and this is a box, it's a nerve stimulator, and it was presented a couple of years ago at ACR and more data uh, presented of this vagus nerve stimulator and difficult to treat patients. And I don't know what it means other than it's kind of interesting that if your phrenic nerve is stimulated, you get attenuated autoimmunity and less uh, RA. Uh, it's not ready for prime, prime time, but just think that we might have to have other options. Rationale for treatment in RA, what about safety? I have to talk about oral surveillance. So just two um, slides on oral surveillance. So this is looking at MACE by age. So obviously under 65, the MACE events of um, TOFA combined, um, you can see here, we're far lower than the older age group. They're about half as common. And also in the TNFs, they were um, not half as common, but less common in the under 65 than over 65. Age and past MACE events, men and smoking drive a lot of the data where there were differences, just to know. So smoking, current smokers and past smokers had higher event rates on tofacidinib um, than never smokers. And you can see the differences there. So smoking will drive your cardiovascular risk events as well. So how do I think about it? Highest risk of having a MACE is people who have a MACE. No kidding. That's always true. Highest risk of cancer are people who would have cancer before. Elevated risk older patients, past MI, of course, past events, men and ever or current smoker, lowest risk younger in this trial. So that would still be age over 55, but female never having had a MACE event, never smoking. So even within a high risk population, there's actually low risk patients. The data are mostly driven by a small group of patients. Same with if we have highly active RA, the data for joint damage erosions are only driven by about eight to 15% of the patients. Oral surveillance for PEs, history of VTE, of course, increases v VTEs, but you can see glucocorticoids, BMI, I don't know why, but antidepressant use, there's some speculation as to why. Gender might make a difference, older age, uh, younger women on the pill that were in this study or on um, HRT, because we know that's a risk of clotting, and hypertension. So not all the same risk factors as MIs, but some. So in conclusion, there is rationale for RA treatment, but I think we need more research. We need to know biomarkers of who's going to respond, of who's going to lose response. And I think we need more research on the optimal order of treatment. So with that, I'd like to open it up for our panel. And also, if anyone has questions, don't forget to bring them in. Janet, reading between the lines, I could tell that you were not a huge fan of the prednisone background that Martin uh, presented, neither am I. Uh, so, uh, and I think that there are various drugs like hydroxychloroquine or uh, even some of the newer medicines, like perhaps when MK2 inhibitors come along and if they're safer than JAX, they'd be a nice sort of oral complement to biologics. Tell us about your feelings about prednisone. Right. So first of all, um, I think it's a drug that we love to hate and love to love. So prednisone does help our patients and we know it, it does help inflammation and it decreases um, it basically it decreases erosions early uh, in addition to methotrexate. But I think um, what we have to think about is, do we have other options that might be safer? So as a, for instance, I must say, I use lots of glucocorticoids, but IA, intraarticular, multiple joints, and they seem to be then 
treating the patient pretty effectively in addition to starting my DMARDs at the beginning um, or where I can control it like intramuscular. So yes, I'm giving glucocorticoids, but at least in Canada, most of our patients in the early RA cohorts are not still on prednisone at a year. We're probably more like 15 to 20% and a lot of other cohorts are uh, 40 to 60%. So I think this steroid addiction is less because they do help all sorts of other aches and pains. Um, Eric, what, what do you think about uh, glucocorticoids in rheumatoid arthritis? I try to limit as much as I can. I think that, you know, and it's a discussion you have with patients all the time because it, it, it's both ends because people say, well, it makes me feel better. So I kind of like it, but more and more patients are also fearful of steroids because they've read and they know. So it's, it's, you get both of those, um, you know, I, the threshold I use is five milligrams. I'm, I'm a little bit more sanguine about leaving somebody on two or three or four milligrams if that's what it takes to keep their disease under control. But I do my best to, to avoid it when we can. <laughs> and count the pills so they don't yeah. just get a giant prescription, yeah. maybe, possibly. Yeah. Um, right. And I think if we had other things, analgesics that worked more effectively for the non-rheumatoid flare damage, mechanical back pain, et cetera, that that would be more helpful too. I mean, yeah. let me ask you, Jana, a follow up with another safety question. And, and so, as you said, and, and showed that very clearly, we don't have great information to help us choose between all the available options. Even after we failed one, you know, people can respond to everything else. And, and I wonder in your area in Canada, has the oral surveillance data changed the calculus? In other words, prior to that, we were sort of thinking that, well, jacks are the same as any other biologic. They're sort of on the table as you start thinking about options and you just have to pick and choose and hope for the best. Yeah. But has that changed that calculus and right. are people steering away? So like in the US, we, we got our first jack and I think you were 2013 and we were 2014. So we had a lot of experience on, on jacks and um, two of them are publicly funded in Canada currently um, in many provinces. So uh, people stayed on their jack. Hardly anyone came off of tofacidinib or other jacks because of oral surveillance, very few. But new jack prescriptions have gone down somewhat, whereas I think new jack prescriptions used to be probably 40% of the RA, a new prescription market of first advanced therapy in Canada. I'm just estimating here different provincial variation. And now it's probably down 10%. But I think people have steered away from saying, I know about this, Jack. I don't know about the others. So can I assume the other ones are safer? So they've either steered away from Jacks or they've steered away from one of the Jacks that has the data. So I think we're all waiting for the baricidinib data to maybe um, help us understand this more. Yeah. Um, so, so let's, let's move on. It's great dialogue. And I think uh, next we're going to have Phil give us a, a treatment selection in psoriatic arthritis. Well, thank you, Janet. Uh, so yes, let's dive on in if I can. There we go. So uh, I apologize. These are my disclosures. And then this is the issue. So PSA, as you know, has all these members of the orchestra, these different sections. So there's violins, there's cellos, there's trumpets, there's uh, uh, piccolos playing along. And so um, when the patient is first in with you, all of these sections may be going fortissimo, uh, but then uh, as you treat, some may diminish, but others may not diminish. For example, I often find that a person that has a really difficult Achilles enthesitis when they come into the clinic, um, their joints will respond fine to whatever I'm using. Their skin will respond fine, but that darn Achilles tendon insertion is just not responding well. And the person has to continue with the boot and they're, they're, if they're, especially if they're doing anything in the way of manual work, they're really hobbled. So it's really important for us as clinicians to attend to each of these domains when you're doing uh, questioning about history and exam. Uh, and I think that patients really like it when they see you trying to quantitatively assess this uh, on each visit. In our clinic, we, we do all the stuff that goes into the minimal disease activity criteria, for example, uh, and, and they really like it. You'll also see some data that I'm going to show you about the new treatment guidelines that take into account 
uh, the inflammatory bowel disease and UBI discomponent. And of course, we need uh, that's at the bottom of this slide. And of course, we need to keep in mind that there are all these comorbidities that patients have to attend to as well, such as this poor woman with uh, metabolic syndrome, hyperlipidemia, obesity, uh, and hypertension. So uh, here's a cartoon from Chris Richland's New England Journal article summarizing PSA. And it nicely outlines the point that there <clears throat> may be different cytokines and cellular uh, immunophenotype in the different tissue domains, whether it's uh, and the synovium, or it's the enthesis and it's uh, the enthesis insertions, and be aware that some of the migration of cells to that site is coming from, <clears throat> from the bone marrow uh, into the uh, tendon insertion site. And then of course, the skin and the gut as, as indicated here. Stefan Siebert uh, from Glasgow has uh, generated this article, which suggests that there may be a uh, tissue cytokine hierarchy, where in certain tissues like the skin, we'll see prominently uh, the IL-17, IL-23 axis uh, at play, uh, TNF, to a, uh, it's uh, ubiquitous throughout these, these different tissue domains. But in the axial skeleton, it could be that it's limited to more IL-17 and TNF. This is an area of controversy that we're still trying to understand more about the difference between axial psoriatic arthritis and axial spondyloarthritis. Here are the just published uh, GRAPA treatment guidelines that were updated in, uh, uh, this year. And the, uh, although the work on it has been going on uh, for over a year. Uh, by the various committees that uh, look at these clinical domains. What I like about the uh, treatment guidelines is that uh, they look at each of these different key clinical domains and then ask the question, what works in that particular clinical domain? And uh, what uh, do we have good, strong evidence for versus weak evidence versus no evidence? Uh, and uh, ask us to then take into account what are the key domains that the patient is expressing and choosing therapy? So for example, uh, in peripheral arthritis, uh, you could choose between the CSD MARDs, but also the various biologic DMARDs that are approved for psoriatic arthritis, or one of the targeted synthetic oral DMARDs, such as the JAK inhibitor or a primalast. Uh, it doesn't force one the way the, uh, the ACR guidelines, for example, do to, to go down a linear path where you almost arbitrarily pick one over the other. I find that depending on the patient in front of me, uh, that, that, it's going to that it's going to differ. So for example, a person in front of me may say, well, gee, my sister has multiple sclerosis or I have a family history of lymphoma, therefore, they may not be as enthusiastic about starting with the TNF inhibitor uh, versus an IL-17 or an IL-23 inhibitor, which don't have those uh, issues in their background. And so I think each patient uh, needs to have this kind of nuanced approach. Now, the, I mentioned earlier about the uh, spinal disease. Uh, here's the evidence table that goes into uh, the previous slide. And if we look as focus in on the axial component of psoriatic arthritis, we see some of the agents here that have shown good efficacy, either in ankylosing spondylitis studies, such as the TNF inhibitors uh, or the JAK inhibitors, for example, or we actually have a, 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 a trial in axial PSA, for example, the IL-17 inhibitor secukinumab. So that goes into strong recommendation. The reason the IL-23 inhibitors are over on the right-hand side, no recommendation, insufficient evidence, is that although um, there is an interesting sub-study of uh, the Guzelcomab data from the DISCOVER-2 trial in which patients who had back pain and radiographic evidence of sacroiliac changes consistent with sacroiliitis uh, had improvement with Guzelcomab during the course of that trial it is not definitive evidence. Uh, we really need uh, the results of the ongoing STAR trial uh, 
in which patients who definitely have axial PSA verified by MRI scanning are being entered uh, and will have a sense of whether this is uh, beneficial or not. If so, then it will stand in contrast to the two failed trials, which Eric will allude to in ankylosing spondylitis with one with uh, the drug risinkizumab and the other with the drug uh, ustekinumab. And then here is more of the evidence table, which, uh, and one of the changes here is that you know, for enthesitis, it used to be that we said methotrexate doesn't work in enthesitis because there just wasn't data. Now we have what's called the SEAM trial in which methotrexate was compared to a tanercept. And methotrexate actually per, per worked pretty well in that trial in controlling uh, enthesitis. And so uh, that's why it's now joined uh, the conditional recommendation box, whereas other CSD MARDs such as hydroxychloroquine still are considered uh, no recommendation and sufficient evidence. And then there is special considerations for the various topical therapies for the skin and nails. Now we also have to take into consideration, although only present in perhaps five up to a maximum of 10% of patients with PSA, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and uveitis. And here the TNFs stand out, especially the monoclonal antibody construct as, a, as compared to a tanercept. And then we have some fledgling evidence that maybe uh, JAK inhibitors uh, can be beneficial. In fact, we have more than fledgling evidence. We have strong evidence that uh, JAK inhibitors can be helpful for Crohn's and UC, as well as IL-23 inhibitors. Uh, but the IL-17s, as you know, are uh, recommended against in relation to inflammatory bowel disease. And we just have insufficient data around uveitis for many of the compounds. Now, keeping in mind that there are strong comorbidity issues with psoriatic arthritis patients, including, for example, obese patients who have fatty liver, then there is this table uh, from the 2016 published guidelines from GRAPA that, that urge caution for various drugs that, for example, in, in patients that may have underlying liver disease, uh, there may be caution about uh, patients uh, with uh, underlying depression with certain drugs and so forth. In contrast, the ACR guidelines, I'm just bringing up here briefly, just to say they sort of guide you in a linear path and they were in interesting in that they, uh, the evidence based on non-NMA uh, 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 methodology uh, uh, suggested that TNF inhibitors were both more efficacious and safer than methotrexate. And so thus uh, choosing TNF inhibitor as the first out of the shoot for treatment of, of our patients uh, before uh, an oral agent such as methotrexate. And then all of the other agents that now have stronger evidence, including the IL-17s. Since this paper was published, we have head-to-head -head trials that show relative equivalence of uh, IL-17s with TNFs in the musculoskeletal domain and superiority in the, in the skin domain. Here are the, uh, a list of all the uh, PSA therapies that are either approved or are in the, sh uh, in the process uh, toward um, approval and development. And one of the uh, items I want to bring your attention to is that we've got several interesting new IL-17 inhibitors uh, that are in process, uh, including bimikizumab, which is an IL-17A and IL-17F inhibitor. Uh, as well as Izocabep, uh, which uh, and sonolocumab, which are uh, small molecules, but given parenterally uh, and are binding to albumin, so may have interesting differences from the other IL-17s in terms of tissue di uh, distribution. And we also have several new uh, JAK inhibitors with different flavors coming along, including uh, Ducravacitinib, uh, which is a, uh, IL, a, sp a specifically TIC2 inhibitor, which is going to have strong efficacy for IL-23 inhibition, and thus is going for a psoriasis, as well as psoriatic arthritis indication. Now I'd like to just finish up with a few comments about treatment strategies uh, that are noted uh, in this agenda. 
first of all, what is our target of treatment? And I, I put forward two for you. One is minimal disease activity criteria and all the items that are measured as part of that criteria are in the orange circle here. And then the DAFSA criteria and all of the items for that are in the blue circle. Arguably, the DAPSA is more joint centric. It's more for uh, measuring articular response, uh, whereas the MDA includes assessment of enthesitis and skin disease, so a bit more holistic. Here specifically are the MDA criteria, seven items, and if five of them are met, then the patient is in a state of MDA or low disease activity. And if all seven are met, then they're in very low disease activity, which we consider essentially remission. So we do this in, in our practice uh, regularly with patients. And here uh, is the data from the Tycopa trial uh, that was conducted where one arm of the study, patients were not in MDA, visited with monthly, had to have their therapy tweaked. And the other arm in which patients were seen every three months and didn't have any specific quantitative criteria. And here was the escalation, uh, uh, either adding a CSD MARD or adding a TNF inhibitor. And here is the outcome where there was clearly better results in the uh, joints, the skin and physical function in the uh, treat to target uh, intensification of care group. I would like to just mention with the single slide, the fact that uh, about 20% of our patients, maybe a little bit less than that, have concomitant fibromyalgia, uh, uh, or even more have this phenomenon we call central sensitization. And as you can see with this uh, here, this study in, uh, done in Jerusalem, I mean, excuse me, Tel Aviv, there was a uh, uh, almost doubling of the disease activity measures that uh, included uh, patient reported outcomes like the DAPSA score, the MDA, and the MDA, no patient who had concomitant fibromyalgia could get into that state, uh, whereas many patients, uh, almost 50%, uh, who uh, were not with fibromyalgia could get into that state. Uh, and so you have to keep that in mind uh, when you're evaluating your patient. Maybe their, their continued high scores don't reflect uh, immunologic disease activity, but rather a, a certain amount of central sensitization. And so maybe we should not be switching from their current immunobiologic medication, but instead to a uh, treatment that's more appropriate for fibromyalgia. Here's a study about intensification of treatment. Patients uh, were uh, treated with who were on methotrexate and not uh, uh, responding well, uh, were either at, had uh, adalimumab added to the methotrexate 15 milligrams, or they had escalation of methotrexate. And then the outcome was looking at those that achieved MDA or minimal disease activity. As we can see, 41% uh, in the group that had adalimumab added achieved MDA, uh, whereas uh, only 13% that had escalated in methotrexate. So it appears to make more sense to add adalimumab. Then what happened to the patients who had adalimumab added, but didn't quite make it into this low disease activity state, uh, six, roughly 60% of that original population. So what, what you can see on the right-hand side is that when they had adalimumab intensified to weekly treatment, uh, that 30% of them could then achieve MDA. So it does make some sense to consider intensification of therapy if allowed by insurance, and there was no safety compromise by doing this in this particular study. And this is my last slide, which is just to indicate what do we do with patients that aren't responding to anything. Uh, that we're doing uh, currently. And so we're starting to experiment off-label with various combinations, including, for example, putting together a relatively benign medication, such as a primalast with a biologic, or one of the newer IL-23 inhibitors that have good safety profiles and not, not uh, major safety and uh, in serious infection rate together uh, with the biologic. Indeed, there's a study underway that Janssen is doing called the Affinity Trial, in which they're putting together golimumab and guzelcomab uh, 
uh, to treat PSA. So we're going to see more of these kinds of combination trials, I think, coming along for our difficult to treat patients. And then eventually we're going to be using some bispecifics where you have two different uh, mechanisms of action on the same drug. And we'll be having more biologic um, biomarkers uh, to guide us in our more appropriate selection of treatment in precision medicine approaches. Thanks very much for your attention. Great, and thanks so much, Phil. So I'd like to ask just briefly to both you and Eric, um, my, my question is actually pretty easy. If a patient doesn't have any of the comorbidities or diseases that associate with PSA, what do we choose? See, it's easy, but it's not so easy. So uh, <laughs> Eric's smiling. Eric, you want to go first? No, I'll tackle it first. I, I think, um, you know, when we can, uh, we typically choose between a TNF inhibitor and an IL-17 inhibitor. Um, if there's a lot of skin disease, I would certainly lean towards the latter. Um, if skin disease is milder, I think a TNF is certainly on the table. And, and as something we've been doing for 20 years, that you know, so the natural instinct is to is to not change what's worked for you, and which is not unreasonable. Um, so curious what Phil thinks. And, and then I, I also want to circle back because I do want to ask Philip about the axial disease. I know that's an interest of yours, but, but I'll let you take Janet's question first. So part of it, it has to do with the amount of hair that my <laughs> assistant who does the prior authorization in the, in the clinic has. So if, that day, oh, there you go, Janet, you displayed it. So uh, she'll come to me and she'll say, Phil, why did you choose, uh, convince the patient that they, need, they were to go on X drug that I can tell you the formulary <laughs> manager is gonna shoot that down. So we often will um, we'll go the easy route uh, and uh, uh, oftentimes that's a TNF inhibitor, as Eric says, because it's been, they've been around for a long time and well entrenched in the formularies. But um, after that, I think it's open and fair game. And it really depends a lot on the patient. Eric's already alluded to the fact that uh, a patient with a stronger amount of skin disease, especially in sensitive areas like uh, the um, um, penis or um, uh, the scalp, for example, uh, these are patients that are going to really appreciate having an IL-17 or an IL-23 active agent. Some patients who um, uh, are traveling a lot now that the pandemic is winding down uh, and are going through TSA may prefer an oral drug like a JAK inhibitor. And so I think that it really is a conversation with the patient and safety is driving a lot of this. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, briefly, axial, overrated, underrated, underidentified. Yeah, I want to ask Phil that because I and I think it's going to be becoming a bigger issue because the number of people who have purely axial disease is quite small, but but the number of people who have some degree of it is not insignificant, as many as forty percent. And with the dermatologists really leaning in on IL-23 inhibitors as their first biologic lately, how, how do you think of that? I mean, I, I certainly haven't seen a lot of people suddenly complaining of a lot of spine disease on IL-23, but I worry about that. And, and when they have a lot of axial disease, I do try to talk the dermatologists into an IL-17 inhibitor because I just know we have better data there. What, do, what are your thoughts, Phil? So one of the things that we do is try to ascertain is there inflammation going on and so we'll like yesterday a patient i saw where we decided okay before we make any recommendation here let's get a pelvis mri let's get a, a lumbar mri and and look to see if they light up if they don't light up if they've just got some underlying degenerative arthritis in the spine then i feel okay, maybe we can step back, try a few other approaches to their spine pain, uh, but not feel so a push to get the, getting, because we have the same issue where the IL-23 is on board and we're, we're not quite sure, is this uh, adequately controlling the spine disease? And so, um, uh, but if the patient is lighting up and their SI joints, for example, then I agree with you uh, that we'll, we'll make sure that we're taking that into account and in trying an IL-17 or a TNF inhibitor. 
Excellent. I think that's a really good segue too to hearing what uh, Eric is going to tell us. So Eric, the floor is yours and I'm sorry that I've talked too much. I want to make sure you have enough time. No problem. So um, treatment selection in axial spinal arthritis, and I'll, I'll make this simple, we don't really have great information on how to make those choices. I think it's a little different than, than what we know about in certainly in PSA and to a certain extent in RA. So I'll start with um, treatment recommendations. These were an update presented at the ULAR meeting recently. And a and couple points, it, they haven't changed very much in the years since these first came out. Um, and a couple points to make is that um, they, they continue to stress non-steroidal anti-inflammatories as first-line therapy. And I think that's really important because for the most part in axial spinal arthritis, we are worrying about symptomatic treatment, much more so than preventing progression of disease, which is really the primary issue in rheumatoid arthritis in many cases, and certainly a big issue in psoriatic arthritis. And so when you're dealing with just symptomatic management, then it makes sense to consider an NSAID first before going on to a biologic or more recently, a JAK inhibitor. The update that came out at ULAR basically added JAK inhibitors and parity for TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors for axial spinal arthritis, although they noted um, that most uh, clinicians are going to use biologics first and will continue to do so. I'm not sure that that's entirely based on the oral surveillance data as much as it's just that's what people have commonly used. Uh, and they modified a few other things, talked a little bit about what the target is for treatment, which I'm going to circle back to in a second, um, and talked about, um, you know, when do you make a change and when do you switch therapy? Um, and one of the things they stress, which I think is really important, is that in a patient who has been on whatever treatment you've selected for three months and isn't responding, um, they suggested that it should trigger a reassessment of the diagnosis to be sure that there's not something else going on. And in particular, as Philip alluded to, we've got the same issue with fibromyalgia and central pain here. And to make sure that you're not trying to address that by changing the biologic when the true answer is to add another agent like duloxetine or something like that. Um, in terms of which drugs to choose and particularly which biologics to choose, and, and we're talking about biologics because we have no decent data that suggests that any of the non-biologic DMARDs up until we get to the JAK inhibitors work on axial disease, um, it turns out that they're all fairly comparable. And this is a large study that was um, published recently looking at the Nordic registries across several different countries um, looking at secukinumab or TNF inhibitors, and the curves are actually more similar than different in terms of how long people stay on drugs. And they concluded that uh, an IL-17 inhibitor was really not any better than a TNF inhibitor, and both are reasonable options. Um, more recently, we have data with the JAK inhibitors. So here's tofacitinib, and I won't go through all the details, but clearly works, clearly works at a level that's pretty comparable to a TNF or an IL-17 inhibitor, um, now comes with the baggage that goes with some of the toxicity, although that was all done in RA, and so how well that translates into AXPA with less significant uh, systemic inflammation is not entirely clear. And then finally, at uh, ULAR this year, we saw data on upadacitinib. They presented two um, phase three trials. I'm just showing you here the one on radiographic AXPA in BioDMARD and adequate responders, uh, and you can see the response rate, which is comparable to the kind of response rate you get as a first pass with a biologic. Um, they also showed data with non-radiographic AXPA, and the curves, the, the graphs were really almost superimposable, um, which is, I think, uh, an important segue into how do we select treatment in axial spinal arthritis? And I've laid out some of the issues here um, what I'm going to show you is a little bit of data for the first few and then not so much for the rest because we just don't have a lot of good data to help us make these decisions. I think the first question really ends up being, um, is there a difference between radiographic disease, radiographic XPA, or what we formerly called ankylosing spondylitis, and non-radiographic XPA in terms of selecting treatments? Um, does the 
difference in structural change, particularly with the sacroiliac joints, which is the really important element here, make a difference? Um, and the answer is probably not. Um, and, and what we've learned is that these are just sort of different facets of what is ultimately the same disease, that it's axial spinal arthritis, um, that people may have uh, non-radiographic disease that progress, although not most of them. People may stay as non-radiographic disease forever. People may present as radiographic disease up front. And so there are a lot of different disease courses that um, play out. Um, but at the end of the day, they respond very similarly. And, and I go back to this data um, from the Sertilizumab Pegall trial. And this was back a few years ago. They did their trial in axial spinal arthritis after the whole concept of non-radiographic disease was really coming out, um, which is different than the other TNF inhibitors that ran their trials in AS before we really were thinking about non-radiographic disease and how to manage it. And so what they did, which was really fascinating, was, was that they were able to include both um, AS or radiographic disease and non-radiographic disease in the same trial. And that's different than what we've seen with other biologics where um, you can compare across trials and see pretty similar response. Here is it in the same trial, in the same sites, with the same investigators, with the same patient populations, um, but for the distinction between non-radiographic and radiographic disease. And at the end of the day, the response rates were essentially identical. Um, we've seen similar data in clinical trials with other biologics and with IL-17 inhibitors. And we've seen similar data in registry data. So here's just a small study from Southern uh, Sweden from their registry, which basically shows that people with non-radiographic disease um, respond about the same to TNF inhibitors as people with uh, true radiographic XBA or AS with the slight distinction that we've seen time and again is that women are more likely to have non-radiographic disease um, because they just don't seem to get the same degree of radiographic change. Um, this is from the British registry, which shows survival curves, which is a, a essentially a surrogate uh, for response to therapy. You stay on a drug if it's working for you. And the survival curves um, for biologic therapy in patients with either non-radiographic or radiographic disease is the same over time. Um, again, lots of data that suggests these people respond about the same. Um, and I think this brings us finally to um, the issue of uh, treat to target. And uh, Janet talked about that a bit with rheumatoid arthritis. Philip showed us the Tycopa st study and psoriatic arthritis. Treat to target has clearly been shown to be beneficial in, in uh, long-term outcomes in RA, um, less so, but clearly beneficial in psoriatic arthritis, or at least less data, not necessarily less beneficial. Um, in AXPA, in a disease where most of the outcome measures are patient-reported outcomes, which I don't mean to dismiss, but they are a bit more subjective, they didn't achieve the primary endpoint in this Tycopa trial, which was a treat-to-target trial um, versus usual care in AXPA. They did see some improvement in some of the uh, uh, secondary endpoints, but they failed on their primary endpoint. And I think we're left with um, less clear data that treating to target is uh, as critical in AXPA as it is in some of the other diseases we treat. And one of the reasons has to do with what are our outcomes and what are we targeting and what, what goals are we trying to achieve? And I circle back to this, which I thought was a fascinating study that was presented a number of years ago at an ACR meeting, um, looking at degree of change in spinal ankylosis. So the MSAS, which is a way of measuring structural change in the spine, progression of structural change in spinal radiographs. And if you look at the curves on the right, you see there's, as usual, that sort of spectrum of people who have, uh, uh, in the GESPIC cohort, people who have um, worsening of their structural change, or in some cases at the lower end, some people who get better. I don't know that they necessarily get better. It's reading the two different sets of radiographs. But what's really fascinating is if you look at the little blue triangles, that's change in function, and it bears absolutely no relationship to the structural change. And they calculated that you would need to have 25 five MSAS point progression over two years, which is virtually impossible, um, to have even a small difference in the bath ankylosing uh, spondylitis functional index. So 
I think this speaks to why um, the differences between non-radiographic and radiographic disease, and again, that really is based on sacroiliac joints, not on spine, but it does sort of carry over because you see less spinal progression in the non-radiographic XPA patients. I, I, don't, I think they all respond about the same because we're treating symptoms and not necessarily functional change over time. So now we're going to get to the, the non-data portion of what I want to talk about, and that gets into some of the other reasons why you would select um, for, for therapy. Um, you can look at demographics. Does age matter? Does gender matter? Well, in fact, gender matters a bit because it's clear that um, women respond a bit less well to some of the biologics that we use, and that's come out in a couple of recent studies, but they don't respond less well differently from one biologic to another. So it doesn't help us select between therapies. It's just something we need to be aware of that women may respond a little less well to some of the therapies we choose. Um, Philip very nicely talked about comorbidities, and I think that's a real important issue here as we think about our AXPOT patients, those with psoriasis, those with inflammatory bowel disease, those with a history of uveitis. And these are places where um, it, treatment selection may be important. And again, if you have a patient with AXPA who has concomitant psoriasis, and particularly if it's pretty bad, then you may steer, as I mentioned in, in the psoriasis section, to an IL-17 inhibitor rather than a TNF inhibitor. For uveitis, Philip mentioned um, that uh, TNF inhibitors, particularly the monoclonals, are going to be more effective. For inflammatory bowel disease, we're going to steer away from the IL-17 inhibitors. Um, the whole issue of cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome is really critical across all of our diseases, but it doesn't really help us select between therapies and unfortunately um, doesn't give us much guidance on how we pick and choose from one drug to the next. Um, drug toxicity, and this is really getting down to the patient level and talking to the patient. And, and uh, Philip mentioned a patient who has a, a sibling with uh, MS, and I run into that all the time. Does that mean they shouldn't be on a TNF inhibitor? I'm not so sure that's actually true, but in the patient's eyes, that's a big issue because they've read about it. Um, and so you need to think about those things. Renal and hepatic function are obviously going to be very important as we start thinking more about JAK inhibitors um, and less so uh, with the biologics that we've used. And then finally, this whole issue of cardiovascular disease and risk of thrombosis and following the oral surveillance trial Again, that was in RA in a high risk, older RA population. How does that translate to our AXPA patients who um, may be somewhat lower risk, their risk of cardiovascular disease to begin with is lower. Um, they may be younger, they're likely to be younger. I don't know, but it's something that uh, bears discussion with patients as it goes along. Um, insurance issues, um, I can't help but mention this because in the U.S., this remains an important and, and a frustrating issue. I have the same issue that Philip has that sometimes you take the path of least resistance because, uh, and especially when you don't have um, great data to guide you on selecting between drugs. You might have a gut feeling that one drug is going to be better for your patient, but absent that data, it's really hard to devote the time and effort that you need to get there. Uh, treatment on board. Um, it's a little different in the AXPA realm because we don't struggle with this step therapy issue. We don't get told they have to start with methotrexate, thankfully, um, it, when we know that's not the right drug for them. I'm not sure where biosimilars are going to play in, but it's going to be an issue, and it's starting to be an issue already, at least in the U.S., with um, infliximab, and we'll see what happens. Um, IV therapy is a really important issue here, particularly in axial spinal arthritis, um, because at least in the U.S., that's a much more cost-effective approach for our Medicare patients. And at the moment, we've got one option. We've got a TNF inhibitor or a TNF inhibitor, basically. You can either go with infliximab or galimumab. Um, I'm looking forward at some point to having an intravenous version of secukinumab, which will at least give us another alternative, um, either as first line or in patients who fail the TNF inhibitor. Um, and then lastly, and, and in the new guidance on treatment um, for AXPA that was presented at EULA, they talked a bit about uh, tapering therapy and people who are responding. Um, and I can speak to a lot of rheumatologists, particularly in the U.S., who are a little cautious about that because we don't want to get into a situation where we start to taper, the insurance company recognizes that and then backs off their approval and then gives us a hard time if people actually flare and need to be on more drug and say, well, no, we backed off. You said they didn't need it. 
Um, and so we're not going to give you approval to give them the full dose. So we'll see how that plays out. But it is an issue. Um, and I will, uh, I think we're at the time, so I'll leave it there, but uh, wrap it up, turn it back over to Janet to see if we have any final questions or discussions. Well, first of all, Eric, really informative and helpful. And we see the theme going that we really don't know what to use. And a lot of it is driven, of course, by the, the patient physician interaction, but it's really driven in many countries by access and um, our lines of therapy are often access driven. So a question to you is when, when would you consider tapering. Someone's done really well. Their uh, BAS dye has improved. Their CRP is better. Their night pain and stiffness in the buttocks is, is a lot better. When are you going to consider, oh, spreading the dose, tapering or, or not? Well, I, you know, I think in many cases, in fact, most cases, the patient's are already telling me that because they, they've already sort of figured that out and people and, and, and perhaps more so in AXPA than many of our other diseases, because these people respond so well to the biologic therapy um, and they can taper. And I have patients who take, you know, a Tanner step once a month. And, and again, I think it's a little easier here because if we're focused on, um, on symptoms more than structural change, I'm, I'm sometimes a little bit more reluctant in RA, for example, to taper aggressively because I'm worried about the progression of their disease. If it's less of an issue here, um, then I think it's, it's open. Um, one thing I will say that I often do when we start to think about that is I tell them to go ahead and taper, but fill your prescriptions as you usually do, because I don't want your insurance company to get wind of the fact that we're doing this and then start to back off on their approval of your therapy. Sell it on Amazon. Kidding. Um, no, but hang on to it. And, and I don't know, you, know you, probably, you probably don't deal with this, but every year, in January, it's like Groundhog Day that people have to get their new prior authorization. And I have many people who go a month or more without drug while they're going through the insurance authorizations. And so if we start to taper, I tell them, just hang on to that drug. And now you've got a stockpile for the first of the year. Right, right. And again, very country specific and different rules, different preferences. Absolutely. Um, I'd, I'd like a, a quick question for each of you to answer and then we do have one from the audience for phil but a quick one for each of you um so we're thinking axial whether it's axial spa or um, psa with axial um do you maintain the end set when they're doing well so it's kind of a yes or no and i know you had some data but what, what's your what's your gut feeling on it it's a great question because there was conflicting data at ULR with one study saying, yes, it made a difference from a structural damage point of view and another one saying it didn't. And we've seen this before where um, there have been conflicting studies. For me, it's more driven by safety. Uh, and so if it's an elderly male that uh, is, um, has some cardiovascular issues uh, or gut potential gut issues, then I, I won't suggest that it be continued in the background. And, and, and obviously, if the patient is not noticing symptomatic benefit from it, then we'll back off. The, actually, the, the one safety issue that we find most driving of this is the creatinine. And so the, I'm hearing from the general doc or the nephrologist, if they've got a creatinine of 1.2 or 1.4, hey, you know, stay away from it. So we're probably a little bit more cautious about non-steroidals in our practice than, than, than some might be in this context. Yeah, and yeah. Eric? Same I, would, here, I would agree fully I, and for all the same right. reasons. I think it's all about safety. I think that the data that NSAIDs are going to change structural progression significantly is pretty iffy. And, and, you know, to what I spoke to, is that going to change function, which is really what you care about more so than the structural progression? I don't know. And I've had enough people who've been on NSAIDs for years and years and years, and you start to see a bump in their creatinine and we've got to make a change. And I, you know, I just try to stay away from that when we can. So if they need it, fine. Um, more often PRN than, than scheduled in that situation. Right. And I think with the advent of biologicals and other targeted therapies, et cetera, that our whole idea on NSAIDs as being the primary treatment indefinitely is, is evolving, as yes. you nicely pointed out. 
Yes. Um, so one last question, Phil, and um, it's a wonderful question for those who want to read it in the, in the question, but I'm just going to paraphrase some of it. So your idea of talking about combinations and what about these conjugates where you might have something that does as a, for instance, a TNF and a steroid or an IL-17 and a TNF, et cetera. Do you think that's going to be the future um, mix and match? Well, I appreciate several things about, about Dr. Uba's question. One is that we are becoming more like oncologists. Um, we, I think we have a certain envy of where they are uh, in terms of biomarkers that guide precision therapy uh, and also uh, with some of the uh, uh, combinations that they use regularly. We I have been sort of bound by the fact that we're a little bit more focused on safety than oncologists might be. Oncologists will say, well, heck, if my patient is going to die from their cancer in a year, let's throw everything at them. Uh, and so, uh, whereas we have patients that are gonna live for decades, and so we're a little bit more cautious. But I think it with judicious use of combinations where, especially if you pair a drug that has a pretty good pretty darn good safety pro profile with one that's maybe mod modest, moderate in their safety profile. I think that's the way to go from a combination point of view. The question about con conjugates is really fascinating and we're gonna see more of these. So for example, it's mentioned a glucocorticoid um, conjugated with the TNF inhibitor. We're going to see this coming forward. I've, I think there's some trials underway with this. Uh, and, and for example, so I think, uh, yes, is the answer. We're going to uh, we're going to become more like oncologists in the future. And again, the caveat, as we all would agree, that with the proper data, we need the studies. And this wouldn't be for everybody, I don't think, from the beginning. It'd probably be for some of these difficult to treat or you've already uh, not fully responded to one. So do we add or switch, things like that. And cost might be more important than safety because cost is a side effect from the patient perspective and the payer sometimes. Um, so yeah, what, what, what a, a wonderful discussion. And um, thank you uh, for a question that was really quite uh, enlightening for us too, I think. So we'd like to thank uh, CSF um, for putting this on and for the attendees and uh, stay tuned for many more great forums to come. And otherwise, uh, we want your feedback. We want you to uh, tell us about ideas for other forum. And uh, thank you for our, our speakers um, as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for inviting us, Janet. That was fun.